Hi, this is Jackie Tantillo, and this is Should Have Listened to My Mother. Briefly, before we get into our interview, I want to remind you, if you're out on the West Coast in California, you can always listen to Should Have Listened to My Mother on KPPQ LP Ventura at 104.1 FM. Or you can catch it, stream it on my tuner app and on capsmedia.org slash radio. And thank you, as always, for listening. And thank you, KPPQ LP Ventura. My guest is a very hardworking mother. She's an award-winning NPR education correspondent and author of several books, co-host of the NPR and Sesame Workshop podcast, Life Kit Parenting, and the daughter of two English professors. I'd like to introduce Anya Kamenetz, and welcome to Should Have Listened to My Mother. (laughs) Hi, Jackie. Mm -hmm. How are you? I'm great, and it's such a pleasure to have you on the show. I really appreciate it. Now, could you uh, tell us your mom's name? We're going to start there. Her name is Moira Crone. And is she with us still? Yes. Uh, yes Thank she God, is. yes. Yes. <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. Yeah. By the, your reaction that there's going to be a wonderful story here, so that I'm really excited. So over the years, you have been writing and reporting on everything from technology and education You've got a number of books that you've written. You've talked about and and reported on standardized testing, too much screen time, high costs of education, student loans. Now, and the list goes on and on because I'm I'm not, I can't list everything that you've done. (laughs) But how much of an influence were your parents? How much of an influence did they have in your regarding your career choice and your interests? Oh, my gosh. Well, uh, when I was little, you know, of course the house is full of books and my parents' love of language was something that they imparted to me very strongly. I have a memory of when I was, I must have been, you know, younger than fourth grade, maybe third grade, and my mother gave me a copy of the, uh, there was a periodical that listed all of the different publications and she asked me to circle all the ones that had, you know, that paid more than five cents a word. So she was looking to submit um, and her fiction, because she's a fiction writer. So for um, herself, she wanted you to look this up so she could submit work. Exactly, exactly. And, you know, <laughs> just uh, yeah. I mean, you know, I remember this on the typewriter going, and I think um, I also remember when I was little that I wanted to be an editor because it seemed to me that that would be the person in charge of my parents. You know, if I were an editor, I'd be the one that they needed to <laughs> please. Oh, <laughs> and this was when you were four, maybe? You had this figured yeah, out? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, pretty young, pretty young. Yeah. Was it because they were working all the time or, or they were distracted often because of their work or you just wanted to be a part of them and what they were doing? I think I got a sense that it was a family business. I didn't feel that my parents were you know, hugely unavailable to me. I just felt like there was something that they also liked to do, which was writing. So, you know, it seemed something that I wanted to do too, or at least be a part of. How great is that? Something, uh, we, I tell my boys on a regular basis, don't look for a job. Look for something that you love to do, and it's never yeah. going to be work, you know. I mean, it's time-consuming and all that. But So your mom was a fiction writer. Can you tell us a little bit about her upbringing and where she grew up so we can kind of set the story? Oh, my goodness, story. yeah. Yeah, she was born in 1952 in a small town in North Carolina, which is where her father was from. Her mother actually grew up in Brooklyn. So they met during the war, um, I think in Panama. And uh, my, my grandmother, who was very glamorous, person and had been in like baby beauty pageants and things in Brooklyn came down and moved into this small town and had three daughters and my my mother's the youngest wow so who met you who met just to make sure my head's on straight who met in Panama your parents or your grandparents my grandparents my my grandfather my grandmother your my maternal mother maternal mm-hmm. grandmother. how wonderful is that so then they picked up and went to North Carolina so especially at that time, it was pretty rural area where they were living. It was a small town. It was, um, you know, uh, Jimmy, my grandfather, became an accountant, and so he was sort of 
somewhat prominent local businessman in a town that was, oh, you know, hogs. It was the thing. Wonderful. It was, you know, Eastern North Carolina. <laughs> yeah. And did your mom carry on her the dreams and and wonderful experience from being raised in North Carolina into her fiction and her future work? Very much. Um, so she has, uh, yeah, she's written a lot about the South, and obviously she ended up then teaching at Louisiana State University. So she edited many writers. She taught many writers who kind of carried on um, the, the Southern literary traditions. That was a big part of, I think, her background and her influence. Is she from a, a large family? Does she have any, any siblings? She's the youngest of three daughters. Wow. So were the daughters being educated, or were they taught to stay home and you're going to have children and you'll be a good cook? They were hugely educated. My grandmother actually attended college, so that was pretty unusual for her generation. She was in the University of Illinois. And my aunt and my mother were all very precocious, um, my my aunt, my her, the, her, the oldest sister of the three, my aunt Lisa, was uh, particularly kind of precocious. She was a m- linguist. She knew many many languages. She ended up becoming a Slavic studies professor, and she used to tutor my mother. She tried to get my mother to learn Italian and Latin when she was like five and six years old. Um, <laughs> she was wow. such a natural teacher. Yeah, she really. Love teaching, and she and my mother were really, really close, even though they were, you know, nine years apart. And what were some of the precocious things that they would have gotten into? Well, so she she tried to teach herself Italian from records. She tried to teach herself Latin from books. Um, She just went through the library in the small town. And my mother also, so my mother ended up um, getting kind of singled out as a gifted student, and she was sent to a... Uh, summer program for gifted students. This is kind of early on um, in, in the world of gifted education. Um, but she was lucky enough to get these opportunities. And I think, you know, my my grandmother in particular was a huge lover of literature. So she she was obsessed with, um, you know, Jane Austen and Dickens. And my grandfather really loved Shakespeare. So they, they really encouraged all three of their daughters to do that type of thing. Right. They weren't sitting around watching TV. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there was all some, of some of that, and you know, small town southern life. But yeah, that was their their uh, ambition was was big, and I wow. think for my grandmother too. Like, she taught school for a few years, but she never found this vocation. And I think some of that ambition went to my went to my mom and her sisters. And in the sixties, did was your mom out there protesting and things, or was she an academic through and through? She went to Smith College, so she had a radical <laughs> background. Um, I remember stories. The stories from the '70s, because she moved to Boston and after college, and I think she was, um, you know, definitely immersed in in the movements of the time, but more more definitely as an artist or the creative type, and particularly a political person. The sisters, was there any jealousy between the girls because she was chosen oh. as gifted or never? Well, they're all very bright. I mean, Lisa was probably the star of the family, the oldest. Um, like, she went to Harvard for grad school, and she, again, like I said, became a professor at University of Chicago. And then my middle, uh, my other aunt, Lori, she stayed, she's the one who stayed in the South. Um, so, yeah, I think there was some rivalry. I don't think they were totally without rivalry, but... They also, you know, loved each other and supported each other a lot. And they also had, they were all really close to their grandmother. So um, my grandmother's mother, Grammy, lived in Brooklyn, stayed in Brooklyn, in Midwood. And uh, they used to visit her every summer. Wow, so your mom has some of the New York blood in her, right? She did. She did. (laughs) So it's really nice because... I mean, like I said, there's three sisters, and the three sisters had a total of five daughters. And at a certain point in about 10 years ago, uh, four out of the five of us were all living in Brooklyn again. And we kind of, we used to see each other, and it was really lovely to have that root. Well, that is really, really neat. That's great. So then you were raised, born and raised in the South as well? That's right, yeah. my, My parents met at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. And they moved to Baton Rouge, Louisiana, to take 
twin jobs in the English department at Louisiana State University when I was about a year old. They met in Maryland, and then you went to Louisiana. How long did you spend in Louisiana? Well, that was it. I mean, they taught at LSU for 22 years or something, so I lived there my whole upbringing. We moved to from Baton Rouge to New Orleans when I was 14. Do you have a sibling? Any siblings? I have a sister. A mm-hmm. sister. And what was it like, other than the writing and you wanting to be the editor, was your house calm and peaceful? Was it like, you know, music on all the time and artists hanging out? What was, <laughs> <laughs> what was oh, the vibe? Uh, <laughs> Poets? <laughs> I mean, uh, so my parents... Neither of them was much of a housekeeper. They both had kind of a, there were books everywhere, probably dirty dishes everywhere, like mugs and newspapers on the floor of the car type of thing. Um, They encouraged us to be pretty independent. So we, you know, I started cooking when I was like nine or 10 years old, helped them make dinner. And yeah, I mean, it was a sort of happy disorder. I would say that my, you know, my friends liked to come over because it was a fun place to hang out. And they also would have their grad students over and and host parties and that kind of thing. Oh, that is so great. Oh, I love that when everyone, it's a hangout house and, you know, people are comfortable coming in and going and then you get the grad students in there. That sounds pretty wonderful. As a disciplinarian, were either your mom or dad better at it than the other or there wasn't much? (laughs) (laughs) Um, I would say that... I didn't get in trouble too much. They definitely tried to listen to my side of things. Um, sometimes they would fly off the handle. I mean, it was more of a house where you yelled, but you also said you were sorry. So, you know, we had our we had our ups and downs, but um, they weren't particularly harsh disciplinarians. But also, you know, we did good. Like my my sister and I, we had good grades, and we mostly did what we needed to do. So I feel like whatever they did, it worked. Yeah, you were good kids, so that was half the battle. So your mom never had to say, do your homework or read, put the turn the TV <laughs> off and read? <laughs> no, not at all. I mean, not Never no. once. Were, <laughs> not really. I mean, you know, there just were so many books in the house, and it was like, it was more like, you know, turn off the light at night, so you, you know, or don't read in the car when the when the street lights are going, because you're going to ruin your eyes. That was more what I heard. No flashlight yeah. under the covers. Oh, how yeah. great is that? Would you spend one-on-one time with your mom in any particular place that comes to your mind, whether it was sitting on a couch or at the kitchen table? Where would you have great conversations with your mom? Yeah, I mean, we both really like to cook, and she had kind of taught herself to cook because my grandmother also was not much of a cook but she we cooked together we would have a you know be a big lot of work during holidays and um that's something I learned from her we also started doing yoga together so we did yoga together like when I was starting when I was like 13 and we would go to classes together and that was a fun thing well that's really unusual I mean not many kids get to do that that's pretty special and what kind of food was there ethnic food involved so, yeah, my mother converted to Judaism, so she really embraced it, and she learned to cook. Like for Passover, we would have lamb, and we would have, um, or salmon, she'd poach salmon. Um, she was a good baker, so a good baker. She loves to make, and she loves to make Southern food, too. So she, you know, when we come home, she'll make food for, like, 12 people. Like, it's uh, just a huge spread. And then she also has a really sweet, And she's done this since I was a kid. Like, she, if you come over, she'll just do the whole, like, cheese and crackers, like, pickles and spreads. Like, it doesn't matter if you're just, you know, stopping by. Like, she really likes to make people feel welcome in that way, and I really enjoy that. That's pretty great. Boy, this is amazing. I want to meet her. (laughs) Yeah, she's great. So I guess it was kind of an open-door policy. I so admire these moms and women who can always put out a spontaneous spread for guests. If your mom was to give you uh, some real personal advice, how would she approach it? Oh, you mean like if she wanted to um, to tell me about some, or some advice for my life? Type of yeah, thing? your life or a career choice or anything. Was there, do you remember, was she straight out? 
and direct, or would she kind of work her way around the conversation when you're kind of like, Mom, what are you getting at? <laughs> um, she would be a little more elusive. She'd be, you know, more kind of inclined to either talk about something that we'd read or a movie, or uh, I would say, you know, she tends to reserve judgment a lot. So, like, she she would kind of, like, sit back and 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 see things, and then, you know, later on she might tell you what she was thinking. And how often do you talk? Oh, we try to talk at least every week or so, um, especially during the pandemic. Uh, you know, during the pandemic, a really nice thing that started. So my mom, aside, besides being a writer, she's also a really accomplished visual artist. And she, in retirement, has had more time to cultivate her painting and her collage. And she has a whole art um, studio in the backyard. And so during the early parts of the quarantine, she figured out a, a Zoom art with Nona, and she got on with my kids every week for like an hour or more, and they would do projects together. How old are your kids? They are now four and nine. Oh, they're still little ones. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's sure. and, and how often, other than the, the pandemic, how often do they usually see her? Well, we, you know, we try to get home a couple times a year, um, and vice versa. They like coming up here. They have friends here. Okay, so, so your kids know them well. They they have a good yeah. relationship. Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. And they've taken care of the kids for a week or so. And I can't wait till they can go down and visit on their own too. Although, um, I mean, we like to go down to New Orleans too, obviously. <laughs> yeah. Are they? Are you outside of New Orleans or right in city proper? They're in the city. They're, They're in the, the city. city. So the kids yeah. must love being able to run around and see all of that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's a great. It's great. Would you say that your mom is a fulfilled woman? <laughs> well, gosh, I mean, uh, I think that her mental health has gotten better since she's been retired. She and my dad get along super well. You know, they're married since 1979. Um, they're inching up, um, and I guess that's the golden anniversary, right? Um, I don't keep track. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember how long how, I'm married. I mean, God willing, God willing. But yeah, 41 years they've been married. They're happy for the most part. Um, she is, uh, she's got her art. She's got a really vibrant community there, and she loves her grandkids we have another one on the way my sister's pregnant right now so she's gonna have one nearby and i think she's thrilled about that um i don't know i mean whether or not you're fulfilled in your life is a really big question but i think she has a lot a lot going for her and i hope when i'm her age that i have that much yeah she seems vibrant and alive and now doing her art seems like she's in a great place was there a, a manner that was different in how she either reacted to something that you did versus your sister did or how she would discipline you or your sister? Yeah, I think there's been differences over the years. I mean, my in my family, I usually would be seen more as my dad's kid and my sister was closer to my mom a lot growing up. And, you know, she was the baby, so she was she's seven years younger than me, so... Um, I think she, my sister naturally kind of aligned herself more with my mom, and I did so more with my dad. So, you know, it wasn't like something that led to a huge divide. I always felt very approved of and loved by my mom, but um, that was definitely a difference that we saw. Is your mom proud of you? Oh, I think so. Yeah, she says so. Does she tell you? Yeah, oh, yeah, Absolutely. And are you who you are today because of or in spite of your mom? <laughs> I think she's a huge factor in who I became growing up. I mean, the things that I really admire about her approach to motherhood are that um, we never, you know, she never pitted herself against us in any way, and she never made it feel like our that our happiness was coming at her expense or vice versa. So, like, you know, she just was very approving of us. She also was pursuing her own life goals over and above just being our mom. So it never was, you know, seen to us that she was just there for us. Um, but I feel like that's a very healthy template. And she never stinted in her 
approval or affection or anything. I mean, I never had any moment of doubt that she was in my corner, and I think that's really important. It's really important for um, a child that they know yeah. that the, the adult, the parent, is there and loving, and regardless of how busy you may be, just knowing, yeah. especially, yeah, I mean, both my boys are in college, but mm-hmm. we keep telling them, <laughs> anytime you need anything, we are here. We always will work it out. Well, I mean, and I also move in circles of pretty accomplished women, and I think a surprising number of them feel criticized by their mothers or scrutinized. And I never felt that way. I never felt like she was judging me or disrespecting my choices. And I think that's pretty major, especially when there's also, I feel like she did better than she was parented. Like she did over and above the kind of parenting that she got. So did she raise you differently than the philosophies that as she was raised? Oh, my grandmother was a really unhappy woman mm, and really unfulfilled, really limited. And... You know, just so, yeah, I mean, she just did not get much, my mother growing up. She got she got more from, she'll say, she got more from her sister and from the the housekeeper that raised her, Lily May, than she did from her mom. So, you know, so there was a big gap in the way that she was parented and the way that she tried to parent us. Wow, it's, it's amazing how some people can move up and on from an experience like that. And some people just cannot. So that's wonderful. And I love that her housekeeper, what was the housekeeper's name? Lily May. Lily May. Oh, what a wonder. I can only imagine the stories that are there. Yeah. That's pretty great. (laughs) And you knew her as well? Lily May. Oh, no. She she passed away not long, a little bit before I was born. But Mm. there's a painting of her. There's a painting of her that my mother did that's in our house. Oh, that's pretty significant. That's pretty great. Wow. So we have covered so much ground. I'm, I'm curious, when you hear your coworkers or other women that you just referred to that didn't have support at home, do you tend to just be quiet and listen? Or do you say, wow, I, got, I was really lucky? What's the best way you think to, to react to someone who's opening up like that? Oh my gosh, I mean, I, I feel like I'm happy to be around at a time when we can acknowledge that not everybody has a picture-perfect family, and I spent so much time reporting on, you know, mothers in really difficult circumstances who are doing the absolute best they can, and many of whom didn't get that kind of parenting themselves, so I, I you know, I have a lot of compassion, and I'm humbled by that. I think it's also inspiring to know that you can do better. You know, you can do better than you were done by, and that's kind of how we progress as a human race, I think. That's how this podcast um, has come full circle so many times because there are so Mm -hmm. many women that have overcome major obstacles, whether it's physical, emotional um, abuse, and and the list goes on and on. But it's always very comforting to know that we are talking about it now. Yeah, that's right. Among other things, it's very important. I did see something when I was doing some research about your background, and the word mystics came up about your family. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) Is there any truth to that? It's true. It's true. So my, um, I mean, both my parents are very interested in spiritual things, and uh, my dad became a dream therapist in his retirement. Um, my mom is just, she comes by more naturally. So she converted to Judaism, but she's also just a little bit of a psychic. And um, in her paintings, she will sometimes honor, you know, the traditions of New Orleans as far as uh, those mystics. And uh, yeah, that's, that's something that's part of our lives for sure. Mm, it's a wonderful attribute to have, that little extra yeah. connection to those spiritual and otherworldly people and places. I admire that yeah. a lot. Exactly. Anya Kamenitz, thank you so much for joining me. And I'm, I'm really impressed with your, uh, your career and what you've accomplished and the message. Did you want to spend a minute or two expounding on your education uh, corresponding and writing so people oh, have a better understanding? Well, I'd love to 
to let people know about the book I'm working on right now because it's really important to me and it's all about this stuff. It's about it's called The Stolen Year, and it's about children during the pandemic. And um, in order to understand what happened to children during the pandemic, I'm kind of delving into a whole history of how we treat children, um, how we establish public schools and free school lunches and the legacy of things like the Indian boarding schools and the child welfare system. So it's it's getting to be kind of a deep look because I think that, you know, below the surface of, you know, what we say about children, I think there's a lot more to the story. And, um, yeah, I'm digging all that up. And I'm talking to families. I've talked to, you know, hundreds of parents and some teenagers um, about their experiences during this time, and it's been just an incredible experience. You are uh, quite um, eloquent with your words, and your research inspires me endlessly (laughs) because I know Uh the amount of research that's involved, let alone books, and you've been in documentaries and all that kind of Mm -hmm. stuff. And and we as the adults, we we should be doing the job to help the children. The children shouldn't be suffering and having these tough times. And I thank you for putting a voice to it. Thank you. I hope to. I hope to. I'm daunted, but I'm doing my best. I'm Jackie Tantillo, and thank you for listening to this edition of Should Have Listened to My Mother. Again, my guest, Anya Kamenetz. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.